Hi, I'm Owen from Bite Size Irish Gaelic and welcome to episode number six of the Bite Size Irish Gaelic podcast. Even if you're alone learning to speak Irish outside of Ireland, don't despair. Rest assured that there are thousands like you across the globe, all interested in tapping into Ireland's native culture. For all about this podcast, you can visit bitesizeirishgaelic.com forward slash podcast. We'd love to hear from you. And today I've got a very special guest, author, writer, Felicity Hayes McCoy. Do you go to Felicity? Conasatatu? Good deal, Gurmil Mahagadoin. Conasatatu Hayne. Oh, Tom Aero, Sir Fads. Tashigahalan shot a limnuch. Nilescum fui kunda kiri of fi and bosh the kukun nisluya. Oh, well, be she go heaven on soft more high, Michelle. We have layer fad, Bjognok. Size four in his shows for the girl mid egg der in a blena. Ah, be she das, August be she green for initial reached. Yeah, be in green and we as big and gear in galua. So, um, Felicity, like I said, she's a writer. She lives in Bermondsey in London and also Kirkagwina, and that's Ireland's Dingle Peninsula in County Kerry. So, Felicity Falterstock, welcome to the show. And how come you've got two addresses, basically, London and Kirkagwina? Well, because I'm extraordinarily lucky. <laughs> Or the other answer is because it took me 30 years to achieve them. I'm Irish, as you can probably tell from my voice. My dad was from Galway. My mother's people were from Wexford, from Enniscorthy. I was raised in Dublin. And when I was going to school in Dublin, the Irish language was one of my great loves. My father spoke Irish with his grandmother when he was young, so he spoke a bit of Irish to me when I was young too. So I did well with it at school. And when I went to university... I took Irish as one of my subjects. In those days, and I think it's still the case in the universities in Ireland, students tend to get sent to the Gaeltachtsi, mm-hmm. speaking areas in Ireland, on scholarships, if they're lucky, to put what we call a snas on their Irish, to just make sure that you have people around you speaking Irish who are native speakers, so that you'll pick up the right rhythm and you'll, as well as having it on the page and understanding the grammar, you'll speak fluently. So when I was 17, this was where I was sent. I was sent to Karkochina. I was sent to stay with a lady, a banati, lady of the house, in a house which is not more than about eight miles away from the house I'm sitting in now. And that was when I was 17. Fell totally in love with the place, the people, the way of life. Had already fallen in love with the language. But I was 17 and I was planning a career as an actress and a writer. Mm. So... I came back here several times on holiday while I was a student and then off I went, as many Irish people do, to London to build my career. And I ended up by doing that. I built a career, a successful career as a writer and an actress there. Kept coming back on holiday to Carcheina, kept visiting the place, but never, ever, ever thought that I could live here. And at some point in my life, I met and married my husband, Wilf Judd, who's an opera director. I met him when he was an opera director at Covent Garden at the Royal Opera House in London. Oh, wow. And we came here on our honeymoon. Uh, came back to Carcachina, travelled down from Dublin through Tralee, back out along the Dingle Peninsula to Dingle Town, and then further on, the last eight miles of the t- peninsula, which people refer to it as going back west, which is the heart of the Gaeltacht area. And while we were here, we had a wonderful time, but also Wilf fell in love with the place and particularly with the traditional music. So we started coming back (laughs) over and over again and cut to 30 years later, we finally got ourselves and our lives into order and bought ourselves a house back here, the house I'm sitting in now. Wow. And just for somebody who really does not have a concept of where you're sitting right now, Try to put it on the map, like so you describe that you go out west. The peninsula is sticking out into the Atlantic Ocean, right? Yeah. How would you describe it? What part of the island of Ireland? Well, if you imagine Ireland as a little dog sitting up in the sea. Um, <laughs> yeah. People blank when they say that sometimes. But, you know, its head is up in Ulster and its little paws are sticking out into the Atlantic. Down at the bottom, the little feet that are sticking out into the sea, furthest out into the ocean, are a series of peninsulae. And the Dingle Peninsula is 
the most westerly point in Ireland. And indeed, it's arguable that the Dingle Peninsula and the Blasket Islands, which are offshore islands off the end of the peninsula, are the most westerly point in Europe. And I think possibly the best way of describing it is, as it's often been described around here, as the last parish in Ireland before America. Mm, Next up, New York, isn't it? If you look, um, you squeeze your eyes closed just a little and you're standing on the beach, it's possible you might just catch a glimpse in New York. I don't know. <laughs> and it is right near or right north of the Ring of Kerry, which is definitely a popular tourist uh, kind of event or um, a route that people take. But it would be right to say that the Kirkagreena Peninsula, it is quieter, isn't it? Yes, it is quieter. It's a great tourist place. And I mean, lots of tourists do come here. Mm. And there is wonderful, wonderful hospitality back here. There's a, a great tradition in the Gaeltacht of welcoming people into the people's homes. Now, obviously, these days you're being welcomed into guest houses, our bed and breakfasts. But that sense of warmth and friendliness is very powerful back here still. And also, once you get as far west as Dingle and then out beyond Dingle into the west, you're absolutely surrounded by people for whom Irish is the first language. Now, everyone back here speaks English as well, so you're perfectly safe. (laughs) It's okay. But if you want to hear Irish spoken just by kids in the street and by people walking up and down, this is the place to come. One of the places to come. Yeah, and I'll definitely go deeper into that again, because we were talking on the last podcast about how somebody who's visiting might hear some Irish, but they still have to make a point of using it if they want to (laughs) practice it maybe on the locals. So you're the author of The House on an Irish Hillside. It's a book you published. And just on the back of that book, Felicity, it said that the people in Kirkagwina have a way of looking at life that is deeper, richer and wiser. So what do you mean by that and how would you compare them to the rest of Ireland or your own experience in London? Well, I suppose when I wrote that book, it's a memoir and it was commissioned in London. And I think what interested them was my life to a certain extent, but also this fact that I was living in the two places. I was living in Bermondsey, which is absolutely inner city London. I live in a former jam factory near the Tower Bridge, so near the Tower of London, as central as you can get. And also here I am at the end of a peninsula as far west as you can get in Ireland. And I think when I started to write the book and when it was first commissioned, both my commissioning editor and I had a notion that it was going to be about contrasts. It was going to be about someone who lived in the city and had another life in the country and as deep in the country as you could get. But as I was writing it, I found to a certain extent that that was true, but also that in Getting to know this area, getting to know Kirkochaina better, living here in this community, I became very aware of similarities between the two places. And that sounds like a contradiction in terms, but let me just explain it a little bit. What you find here is you find community very, very, very strongly. This is an area, because it's a Gaeltacht area, in which the cultural heritage of the people has been passed on through the oral tradition. So it's an area where Irish is spoken, where storytelling is still an absolutely central part of life and where music is really central. And when we came here and found this house, it was known in the area as T. Nellie Wirish. Nellie Wirish was the lady for whom it was built originally. This would have been back in about 1915. Nellie lived here and her husband, Paddy, married in, but it was always called Nellie's house because it was hers to begin with. We bought the house, knew that it was beautiful, knew that we loved it, knew that it was in an absolutely glorious place, but knew not much more about it. And it was the neighbours who told us that this house was what in English people in Ireland call a rambling house. And in Irish, we call it a house for Bahantiacht. Mm. Bahantiacht is the custom in the Gaeltachty of gathering together in one house in the parish in the wintertime in particular, in the evenings to tell stories and to sing and to play cards and to chat and have a bit of a drink. And these houses are chosen because they happen to be at a crossroads or they're a suitable distance from other houses. Or I think in the case of this one, maybe because Nellie and Paddy didn't have children. So, you know, you wouldn't be waking the baby if you came in here and had a few songs at night. 
Anyway, that's what we discovered. We discovered it was a place for Bohantiacht and we discovered that our neighbours were happy to continue to come in and chat with us and because my husband was a musician and had taken up the concertina and was learning to play traditional music, we had some sessions happening here. And that focused that whole idea that community, the passing on of culture through the oral tradition, the passing on of heritage through storytelling and through music and the words of songs was absolutely still part of life here. Now, strangely, having experienced that and loving it here and becoming part of it here to a certain extent, because people have been immensely welcoming to us, I became more aware of it when I was back in London. I sort of became aware of the people in the flats around us had a community. There was a great sense in inner London of people who used to work on the river because we're close to the river and there was a whole generation of people and generations back of people who did the same jobs and lived in the same areas. I think the community spirit here, the sense of community here in Karkachina has made me recognise and become aware of and enjoy the same sort of thing when I'm living in the city in another country altogether. But here it's still so central to life in a way that I think it's less central to life in other parts of Ireland now. I don't know if you felt that. Yeah, I wonder. I was going to ask you with the comparison of the rest of Ireland, but yeah, where am I sitting now? It's um, in a housing estate in Limerick City, out in the suburbs. People are friendly. I'll wave to the people that I meet the same people down by the River Shannon every day and you have a chat with them, you say hello and you dodge the, the swans <laughs> that are walking across the footpath. But that being said, there's certainly not a sense of community when you compare it to a village or even a town. I'm from Ennis Town in County Clare and, you know, the locals know each other. And that's definitely can be still said for Limerick. So I'm not excluding Limerick from being capable of that type of thing. But I guess it's that modern phenomenon that we're sitting in a housing estate. So there's 100 houses that all look the same and people are nice enough. But to be honest, you don't get to know your neighbours so much. And do you get that sense if you're walking through Cork City or Dublin or even other towns in Kerry? Do you get the feeling that it's definitely stronger in Kirkagwina and in London compared to other places you might travel through? Well, I'm very aware of it in London. I'm sure if I were living in Cork, the same sort of awareness or, you know, Cork or any other city or town in Ireland, the same sort of awareness would be achievable, if you see what I mean. But I think the point that I'm trying to make in my book is that you don't have to run away to some rural idyll in order to achieve a sense of community or in order to achieve an awareness of nature or in order to create a sense of community, indeed. It's just that because I'm living here in Karkarina and it is so much part of ordinary life here for neighbours to be aware of each other, for people to engage with each other in a way which isn't necessarily typical of a city or a town, I think it's made me more aware of it and it's made me more aware of what's desirable about it so that when I go back to London, where I see it there, I admire it and I try and link into it. And I guess at the very beginning when I was putting the book together, my commissioning editor in London was seeing it in a sense as an escapist book. And I was very eager not to write such a book. It's not that people back west of Dingle live some sort of magic, lovely life where they're dancing around the place, doing Irish dancing and not worrying about the price of um, food the next morning or how to pay their mortgage or how to cope with their debts. It's not like that at all. We have perfectly ordinary life back here. And my neighbours aren't any different to people living in the 21st century anywhere else in the world from that point of view. But underpinning life here is something very rich and wise and valuable, I think, which is a sense of the importance of both the individual and the community and the individual within the community. And I think that arises from a strong sense of roots, a strong sense of place, everyone knowing who married into what house, you know, what dowry they brought with them a couple of generations ago. A big, big connection still between the people who stayed here and who still are living here and the people who had to go away and might be living in Springfield, Massachusetts or, you know, in Butte, Montana or in London. Big sense of who you are is where you come from, which is one of the names of one of the chapters in my book. 
Mm. And you mentioned briefly in relation to Bohantiacht that especially it would happen in winter time. I don't know, have I been to Kirkagrina during winter time? Not that I remember. We got engaged on a beach there, but that was in the middle of summer. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> love the place. But what is winter like there? It must be dark, wet. <laughs> yeah, well, that's another big theme in the book, in fact. One of the things that interests me greatly about the oral tradition here and the roots of the inherited stories and songs here is that they go back way past beyond Christianity, back to pre-Christian Celtic Ireland. Carcajoyne means the territory of the people of the goddess Danu. Danu was the fertility goddess, water goddess of the ancient Celts right across Europe and here in Ireland. And that Celtic heritage is very strongly rooted in an awareness of the cycles of the year, the, the changing of the seasons, the sense that the year moves rhythmically, as it were, in a circle from darkness to light and back again. And one of the things that interests me greatly about it is that the seasons in the Irish tradition tie into the way the Celts looked at seasons. For example, if you look at Halloween, we're coming up to Halloween now, that's obviously a pre-Christian festival. Its roots are pre-Christian. And it starts at night in darkness because for the Celts, The beginning of everything was in darkness. Everything begins with a seed in darkness, then moving forward. So for the Celts, the first season of the year wasn't spring, it was winter. You went from darkness towards light, and winter was pregnant with the knowledge that spring was going to come. And that's an experience you understand. That's a way of looking at things you understand when you've been back here through a whole year. Because the winters here are wild really wild. The wind comes in from the Atlantic. We are on the side of the last mountain before you reach the end of the peninsula. The wind hurls in from the Atlantic, hits the mountain and then flings itself down at the gable end of our house and all the houses on this side of the mountain. It's cold, it's dark. It's a great time to sit beside the fire and tell stories and make music. You sort of close down, but there's nothing miserable about it. There's something very bracing and very powerful about it. I say in the book, it's in the wheel of the seasons from spring through the rest of the year and back to winter and on again, that you learn what Karkakoina has to teach you. And it does teach you that you shouldn't be running after the good times and the bright times and the sunniness all the time. When I came back here first, that's what it was all about. And sometimes uh, tourists do that too. It's all about, is the sun going to shine? They get up in the morning and they say to whoever they're staying with, is the weather going to be good today? Well, they say this four seasons in any given day back here that the weather changes so quickly (laughs) but also you learn when you live here to be aware of the seasons and see what each one offers and to embrace what comes as opposed to demanding the bits that you think are nice Mm, very nice yeah yeah we often tell uh, visitors to ireland that you know if you get your week of sunshine you haven't seen the real Ireland and especially not the cliffs of Moher or County Kerry if you're travelling through and the sun is out. That's not real County Kerry. At least it's not a big part of it. You're so right. And, you know, one of the most magical and beautiful stories back here is, and it's all over the country, but, you know, it's back here as well, is this idea that there's this island called High Brazil. Have you talked about that much? No. no tell us more. OK, well, the Celts had a notion. There was an island called High Brazil, which was out there on the western horizon, and it was a magic place. And there are different stories about it. I mean, some people say that it's the land of the youth, so it's the land of the ever young. Other people say it's a place where the souls of the courageous dead travel after death. But anyway, there's a magic island out there on the horizon. And the point about it is that sometimes it's there and sometimes it isn't. Sometimes you can see it and sometimes you can't. And That story has to have come out of the beauty of the mist and the changing of the clouds and the changing of the way the light works when the rain comes in on the wind back west here and on the west coast of Ireland. If you look out the horizon, if you look out these days even to the Blasket Islands on a misty day, they come and go as if they're magic. It looks as if they disappear and come back again. Now, you don't see that on a sunny day, but my goodness, you see the magic of it if it's raining or if it's misty. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Just looking out over the Blasket Islands, 
I could just sit there and drink my cup of tea and watch out over them. Talking about life in Kirkagreen and Ireland more generally, Ireland definitely went through the Celtic Tiger phase in the past decade and slowed down and people went back to all things retro and whatever else. But do you feel that life in Kirkagreen uh, has sped up? Has it kind of stayed slower than you feel in another part of Ireland? Like, life goes on anyway, no matter where you are. We all have electricity and broadband, internet, and (laughs) you have all your modern conveniences. Do you feel that people are more rooted in just being in the moment? Or does it matter wherever you live that you can always get lost in the busyness of everyday life and you have to really be aware of it and maybe slow down a bit? What's your feeling? Yeah, I think it's true. I think you can get caught up in unimportant stuff or indeed just having to keep going and live stuff wherever you are. And certainly, you know, as I said before, this is not a place where everybody lives some sort of idyllic rural life that would be something that would remind you of the 19th century or of times gone by. Not at all. I mean, the kids are here running around. In fact, I suspect that the texting and the having of the cell phones may have been picked up here quicker than in other parts of Ireland, because when you're living in a rural community, that kind of communication is fantastic. If you're halfway up a mountain and you're trying to deal with a sheep that's fallen into a ditch, to be able to take out your phone and, you know, summon up help from your son down below in the farm is the best possible thing. So people here, in fact, really picked up digital communications as quickly as they could. Broadband here now is as good as anywhere else in Ireland. And I would be lost. I couldn't work, for example, myself as a writer as efficiently as I can with a base in two different places if I didn't have the broadband. So that's all there. And the kids here would be texting each other like nobody's business in Irish and in English both. But I think that two things allow you, if you live here, to pause and ask yourself, hang on a minute, how much do I want to be swept along? by the 21st century and how much of it do I want to choose to take rather than being forced to take. One is the seasons, the fact that you're so aware of nature here. You're so aware of something much, much bigger and older and likely to last longer (laughs) than any of us. And I think the other one is the heritage. Part of what people here inherit is a tradition of looking at life, thinking about life, philosophizing because it was a tradition of handing on values and skills to the next generation orally. So you had to have it handed to you, you had to assimilate it, and you had to pass it on. And there is a requirement here, a, a traditional requirement, to go through that process. So generations mix, I think, a bit more than they might in the city. If you know, go to a party, there'll be young kids and there'll be old kids and there'll be elderly people there and they'll all be talking and sharing and passing things from one generation to another. There's more homogeneity of that kind, I think. Not everybody, you know, people live differently. It's not everybody does the same thing. But that is there as a sort of touchstone, which was another name we were going to put on the book before it became the House of an Irish Hillside. It was going to be called Touchstones. And I think, for me, that's what this place offers. And I think since the, the Celtic Tiger in Ireland, wondering if it's perhaps lost the run of itself a bit and it needs to think again about where it's going and what it wants to do, I think those traditional values, that inherited culture, that worldview is something that people in the rest of the country are beginning to become more aware of and want to look at again. It's out there. It's certainly out there on the Internet. People are talking that way. Do you get any sense of that? Yeah, people have definitely, I would say, gone back to their roots a bit. Like there was a period of five years when it just seemed like, well, looking back anyway, People lost uh, the run of themselves in a way. You know, there was a bit of a reality check, which has to happen. I guess these cycles come and go as well, so I can only presume it's going to happen again. Interestingly, I've heard it before about the Great Depression, that it was just long enough ago that it was outside of normal living memory, that people kind of forgot, yeah, systems forgot what's real or what's sustainable and that people last their run of themselves again and it will happen again but mm. yeah I think that's right and I think that one thing that Ireland's cultural inheritance has sort of given it and we can hang on to it or we can decide to walk away from it is 
that notion that you can tap into things beyond the living memory. You don't have to keep reinventing the wheel and you don't have to keep making the mistakes because you can learn from what people in the past thought about. It's something very interesting with storytelling, isn't it? It's basically handing down of wisdom through stories, eh? Absolutely, yeah. And in the Irish language, you know, there's this huge tradition of proverbs. And I talk about that in the book as well, that, you know, I mean, people can take it to extremes and you can get bored to death. I remember in my childhood, there'd be old fellas coming out with a proverb for every occasion and you'd, you'd want to shoot them. But the truth of the matter is that not just in the Irish culture, but in many indigenous cultures worldwide, little distilled nuggets of hard-won knowledge, hard-won experience got passed on through those elegant little bundles of words. And I quote some of them in my book, and they're still used in everyday conversation here, particularly in the Irish language, because they're part of it. People are used to doing that. In the past, you couldn't come out with a proverb, but the next man would cap it with one. And that was almost a game. Certainly, uh, my neighbours here say that that was one of the things that used to happen. You know, somebody would start that up if there was a night of Pontiac, then they'd go round and round and round with a, a proverb that would cap the next proverb. Or a story or a song that would rise out of the one that happened before. And I think, you know, it wouldn't hurt if we had a look at some of those proverbs again. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Given the fact that we're recording this in mid-October, but this episode is going to come out on Iha Hauna, on Halloween. Hmm. Do you have any, maybe when you were growing up, did you have any little Halloween traditions at home? Yes, we did. And one of the things that struck me most when I first went to England was I was very surprised to find that in England people thought Halloween was an American phenomenon, a fairly modern American phenomenon. Whereas, of course, I think it's in America because it was brought over from Ireland and countries in Europe because it's a very ancient Celtic festival. We had, of course, the going round in our Halloween costumes and our masks from door to door to the neighbours. We didn't have that trick or treat phrase that they have in America. But it's interesting to me, that trick-or-treat thing, because we just went and we knocked on the door, they were opened the door, they exclaimed at the fact they didn't know which kids were standing out there dressed as witches or wizards or cats or mice or whatever we came as that year. My first mask was a Mickey Mouse mask, actually. But anyway... Very modern. <laughs> yeah, I was very small at the time. I think it was the only thing in the house and they gave it to me. But anyway, we didn't have the suggestion that if we didn't get given a treat, we would play a trick. But that in fact, is a very old idea because the notion originally and the notion that would have been back here for a long time was on Ihalma. It's one of the times in the year that the ancient Celts believed were sort of thin places. There was a sort of thinness in the fabric of time at those turning points in the year. And the spirit world was very close to the material world and there was passage between the two. And so the spirits would come back that night And you wanted to be sure that they wouldn't be angry with you. And that was one of the reasons why you put things out for them. And take that a bit further, if there's a knock on your door and there's a little devil or there's a witch standing outside, you'd give them something in order to please them. That's where it came from. So whereas in Dublin, we knocked on the door and the neighbours gave us monkey nuts. Do you remember monkey nuts? Are you too young? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Well, they'd (laughs) give us monkey nuts or they'd give us apples or sweets. That is sort of an echo of a much, much earlier tradition where people were trying to appease the spirits of the dead on that night. On one level, they were glad that they came back and they welcomed them into their homes because they were the spirits of the ancestors and they were looking after you and looking over you. On another level, they were always a bit afraid of them, so they wanted to please them, so they left out food for them. Mm, Very interesting. That's nice to link it back. I'm sorry to jump from that to a very practical question, but... As a last question, if somebody is considering just visiting Ireland and perhaps passing through County Kerry, and let's say they've learned a phrase or two in Irish, like Giorit or Pionta Guinness, I like that one. Uh What do you suggest that people do so that they get a bit of exposure to Irish when they're passing through Kirkagwina? Well, the first thing I would say is keep going beyond Dingletown into the West though you'll find lots of people in Dingletown that can speak Irish and will speak Irish too. And when you meet somebody and you would like to speak Irish to them, 
don't hesitate. I mean, do use your couple of what's known as your couple of or your few words, your couple of words. And you'll even find in some places there'll be signs up. Like if you go into a shop, quite often on the counter of the shop, there might be that little sign saying ta fuckalagum or usaiter gailge on sa. Irish is used here, or as I said, couple of fuckal, ha couple of fuckal agum. I have a couple of words, and that means a couple of words of Irish. And sometimes the person you're talking to will be a native speaker and they'll have more than a couple of words of Irish. Sometimes you might be talking to somebody who's working back here and came from somewhere else and is learning Irish too. So anywhere somebody gives you an indication that they'd like you to speak Irish, go ahead and speak to them. Anywhere where you feel I'll have a go and speak it myself and see if someone responds, have a go. I think people are very, very pleased to help. They're very pleased to hear people trying. There are lots of Irish courses back here. So you might well find, I don't know if you're sitting in a pub, that you're sitting beside somebody who's back here learning Irish. You know, there's no reason at all why you shouldn't say two sentences in Irish or three words in Irish and go into English after that. It'll be appreciated. Yeah, I love that tip. I love the advice and I hope that people do follow up on it and I hope to hear from people who end up visiting Ireland for the first time or once again and they've done that and their success stories what happened out of it so Felicity we're going to point people towards Facebook for your book The House on an Irish Hillside and that's by Felicity Hayes McCoy we're going to link see that up from the show notes as well So Felicity, it's really been a pleasure. I learned a lot from speaking with you right now. So gur mila mahagut as the chwedama. Ta fáil to rota one. Gur mila mahagut hein. Ja, vise go hál in lárt I really enjoyed that. And just to finish up this episode of Bite Size Irish Gaelic Podcast, you can leave a comment on this episode. And if you do, I'll make Felicity aware of it, and she'll get back to you hopefully. So that's at bitesizeirishgaelic.com forward slash podcast and you just have to find episode 6 click onto that and leave a comment on the post Uh, you can send listener questions or feedback directly to me as well it's podcast at bitesizeirishgaelic.com that's our email address I'd love to hear from you so until the next episode of Bitesize Irish Gaelic Podcast Slán Bye for now